We're going to begin today with the playing of Amazing Grace. If you'd like to sing along with it, you'd be welcome to do that. It's a, it's a uh, recorded version. It's number 343 if you want to sing along. I'd like to begin uh, with the obituary today as we share this time together. Perry H. Layton, age 92, of Fremont, died Thursday, April 23rd at 2020, on 2020 at Dunkloud Gardens in Fremont. Perry was born June 5th, 1927, Fayetteville, Tennessee, to James T. and Marcella Hall Layton. He was raised in Lincoln County, Tennessee, and graduated from Lincoln County High School in 1944. He served for a year in the United States Navy, then attended and graduated from the University of Tennessee in 1949. He was employed by the George A. Hormel Company as, as a hog buyer for 35 years, working in Austin, Minnesota, Fre Fremont, and Beatrice before returning to Fremont in 1984. <coughs> 
Perry married Donna Erickson on June 4, 1966, here in Fremont. Perry was a member of the First Baptist Church in Fremont, Fremont Masonic Lodge, number 15 AF and AM, Fremont York Rite, where he received the Knights of York Cross of Honor and the Tangier Shrine of Omaha. Survivors include his wife, Donna of Fremont, sister Lucia Layton Blackwell of Maryland, sister-in-law Linda Olson of Missouri, and special friends and caregivers in many ways, Deb and Jim Peterson of Fremont. Psalm 15 says this, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury, and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. It seems to me that today we gather to honor a man who has ascended to God's holy hill because he has that kind of character. A couple other scriptures that I'd like to open with that I think are very reflective of Perry. From 2 Timothy 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. His love of scripture was exemplary. From Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I could see Perry saying those words to us today, but then I also want to remind us of a very special verse from Psalm 116. Verse 15 says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Let's bow. God, we are gathered today in a precious moment. And in this moment, Lord, we recognize that we have been honored to have known Perry Layton, to have him involved in our church, to know that as we gather today, he is not present with us, but he is present with you. We're also mindful today that Donna is unable to be here. And so we ask, God, that today you be very near to her in a very powerful and special way. Lord, may the example that they set be an inspiration for all of us today as we gather here. In Jesus' name, amen. Another song that they had selected was called Going Home.
In these extraordinary times, we have things a little differently today. Uh, we're grateful that we were able to have as many as we could today by using the different rooms available to us. I know that were things different, there would be a lot more people here, and they would be allowed to be here, but there are some going to be watching via streaming, probably, and we also have, uh, are working on recording it, so if you know somebody that would like to have seen it, let us know, and we can make sure they can have a copy of the DVD. But a number of people have already participated um, with their love, and I want to read a few of the things. Not everybody does Facebook, uh, including me, uh, and so we had some printed off, uh, some of the comments that were there, and I thought it'd be appropriate to share some of those comments as we begin. Amanda Hornberger wrote this, May you rest in peace and rise in glory. You had such a gentle spirit. I remember the many nights after kids club and then youth group that you would give me a ride home from church. You always, always waited to make sure that I got in safely, and you always told me to lock the door. I remember the many lunches at Happy Inn, Brass Walk and Wendy's, and afternoon visits and games around the table. I will always treasure the memory of you being there when I was adopted. Thank you for being one of the truest examples of what it means to be a gentleman. Praying for and thinking of your family, love to the FBC family in Fremont, praying for you all. Nancy Long wrote, a God-loving man made his way home. God bless him. Judy Staub wrote, he will be much missed. Melody Scott, he will be missed, such a sweetie. Amy Turner, oh, what great memories I have of Perry and Donna, such a special man. He will be missed. And Deb Peterson is going to share a little later, but she responded to Amanda's tribute, and she said he was one in a billion. Now he is no longer in pain. Doug DePew, who did the ushering and saw him week after week. I will miss Perry. He was a great guy. Always enjoyed visiting with him. Paul Foreman, a great man of God. Mary Weldon wrote, I will miss Perry and his endless prayers for me and my family. When we bought our house, he and Donna came to see it and saw the need for some window repair. The windows had those ropes and weights, and he took them all out and replaced them with new ropes. My dining room table still holds us, too, because he took all my chairs just a few years ago one at a time to his house and took them apart and reglued them like new. He will be missed, praying for Donna. Bev Holman also liked Amanda's uh, tribute, said a great tribute to a wonderful friend and faithful servant in God's kingdom. Every Habitat home put up until this last year had part of Perry's work in it. Bill Cruz wrote, so sorry to hear the news. I worked with Perry on several committees. He was someone I looked up to and learned from. He was a quiet and full of wisdom. I was in many church meetings with him. He would sit quiet. When he spoke, it was important and insightful. A servant heart like no other. In this journey through life, we find people who influence our character and make us who we are today. And Perry is definitely one of those people on my list. Prayers to Sweet Don and family, as well as the FBC family. Deb also wants to share a few thoughts. So Deb, I'm going to have you come on up at this time if you would. Can't make it through. I'm hoping I can make it through all of this. Your sister Lucia said you loved your Lord. You loved your wife so much, and you love your country, and you were proud of your service. Your sister-in-law, Linda, said she was so thankful for the way you took care of her sister, and she will miss you. Second Timothy 4, 7 and 8 is what I think of when I, Perry's the person I think of when I read it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Perry was a good friend. He was a loving husband, a wonderful brother, 
and those that knew him knew all the things that he did, and he did it quietly and graciously. He loved and honored his wife, Donna, and she was always the one he thought of all the time. He wanted to take care of her. She was the love of his life. He was a wonderful example to all of us on how to live and how to love. And I thank you, Perry, for being a big part of my life and so many others. We'll miss you so much until we meet again. Thank you. It's a little different today because we don't have family here that we are providing the, that direct comfort to like we usually would. And Deb and I talked about some of this and thought, you know, there may be, probably if we gave everybody a chance, there would be a lot of people have some memories they want to share. But we thought maybe today it might be appropriate if there's two or three that would like to say something, share a little memory, to give you an opportunity to, to do that. Uh, with the weird social distancing, we're going to ask you just one at a time. And if you want to kind of raise your hand so I know that you're one of the ones that wants to come up, we would do that. But that would be now if somebody would like to do that. No, nobody has to. But if you'd like to. Okay. okay. Then we'll continue with the service. When I think of Perry, there's a lot of things that I think of. And... Uh, when Deb was unable to go out to see him while he was out in hospice, I, I got to take her place. And uh, so I'd go out each day, and, and Perry and I would read some scripture together, and sometimes we'd talk about things. And I, I want to tell you, one of the things he said multiple times, and I need to make sure that you hear it, is that he so appreciated knowing that you were praying for him. Uh, that, would, that meant a lot to him. And I would tell him somebody that had asked about him, and he would say, oh, tell him I, tell him I said hi. Tell him I'm still, still here, still hanging on, appreciate the prayers. And, you know, it was, it, his faith was genuine. It was real. Um, but I want to share a couple of the scriptures that uh, he and I read there together toward the end. One of them is out of Psalm 119, because... For me, this, this is the epitome of, of the kind of a Christian that Perry was. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Anybody that sat in his class or visited with him about the Bible knows that that was him. He loved the scripture. He loved the word. He loved it when you, when you preached from it. And, and I, I, you know, I, in a congregation, you'll have people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And as a pastor, sometimes when you know you've got a, a, a student of the Word out there who really knows the Bible inside and out, you're not always sure what they're going to think about the different ways you approach things. And I remember one time after, after some Sunday, and I don't remember what the sermon was, but Perry made the comment to me about, that was, that was, very, that was very good. And, I, and I, I responded, well, you know, you know the Scripture as well as I do. And he says, yeah, I said, but you approach it a little differently. And I see things I didn't see before. You know, what a kind word. But more than that, what, what a clever insight to know that none of us have learned it all yet. There's always something more in these books, in, these, in the collection that we call the Bible. There's so much there when we treasure it, when we allow it to be like honey, when we read it to observe it. The other scripture that he and I read together is a favorite of a lot of folks, and I think it's important, 
And I think this was the experience of his life, even at the end, as hard as it was. He said this in Psalm, David said this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. You know, while Perry lay out there, he knew he was in the shadow of the Almighty. And he lived his whole life in that shadow, right? He walked with the Lord. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. Wonderful promises of God. I want to read that again, but not in terms of Perry, but I want to read it to you, and I want you to think about why we're scattered here today, and some of us have on masks, and why things are so different, the situation we're in in the world. And I want you to hear these words for you as well. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. God is a great refuge. In times of uncertainty, in times of fear, and walking with God daily is what prepares us for those times of fear and those times of hard, and they carry us through. I always appreciated the way Perry offered gentle encouragement to people. Quiet word, just, just a simple statement or two, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, and so often those statements were appreciation. I, I remember one time I went out to see him, he was in the hospital at that point, and I, I'd probably been out a couple times that week, and, and he said, oh, pastor, you're so faithful to always be here. And I, th- and I looked at him going, but that's just what pastors do, <laughs> you know. I didn't see it as a, as a big thing except the time to be there. But, but he appreciated what people did for him. That's a special thing to have. Of course, you can't, I can't add to what, Don, what uh, Deb already said about Donna, much significant. But she, she was indeed the love of his life. And, and you know, even at, at Dunklow. And when he, was, when he was at the legacy and when he was at the hospital and, and all those times with the surgeries and the illness and waiting, he was always concerned about Donna, wanting to check on her. How is she doing? You know, even, when he, even when he didn't feel good, Donna was deep in his heart. Till death do you part, the vows say. You know, the other thing I think a lot of in terms of Perry has to do with the, um, the giving side of him. And I, I kind of want to, I'll, I'll bring part of it back around to a, a side that many of you know, but in his giving, you know, he really had a sense that as a Christian, we are spending our time not just for the people we know, but the missions around the world, people will never meet. And so I want to read out of Philippians a, a, a note that Paul wrote back to the church at Philippians. He, he made this little comment to them. He said, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. I wonder how many mission folks are greeting Perry up there today saying, you know, your partnership with us kept us on the mission field, made us able to serve God in so many ways. You don't have any idea how many lives it touched because you supported us. Perry had a big vision for God. And he was able to do that because I think in part how he viewed his job. And that was this. And then, now, the first part doesn't apply to him, but uh, it's, it's the passage, and I don't want to chop it off. But Ephesians chapter 4, 28, Paul's talking about how you need to change things in life, and so he's talking to thieves, 
And he says, let the thief no longer steal, but listen to what he says he's supposed to be doing. But rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Well, that's what Perry did, right? But listen to what it says after that. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Laboring not just to provide for myself or my family, but laboring so that I have something to share with other people, something to give to others. That was, I think, one of the things Perry was the most proud of, that he had, that that was his priority, that was his heart. That, and proud may not be the right word, but that that's something he treasured. He knew that when he was able to take some of what he'd earned and share it with others in a meaningful way through mission work, that it was something valuable. I think that's an important example for us as well. He worked to be able to give. And then, you know, you heard in Mary's reading about the, the woodwork stuff that uh, he did, the repair work. He, he did all sorts of things. And, of course, the violins was one of the big things. And I have sitting over here on the chair a violin that belonged to one of my grandparents some years ago. We, it sat in a back shelf and, and uh, attics and all sorts of stuff. And, and when I first met Perry, or maybe the second time, I was over at their house, and we were visiting, and he talked about violins and what he used to do, and he showed me the ones he's got there, and we talked. And, uh, and I told him that I had these old violins in my grand. He said, well, I'd like to see those. I said, well, they're not anything special. He said, well, yeah, but bring them over. Let me look at them. So we were talking, and he looked at them. He says, well, you know, I, I'd, I'd refinish this for you if you'd like me to do that. I said, oh, Perry, it's nothing fancy. You wouldn't have to. He said, no, I don't mind. And, and he took these two old violins that had, had been dinged and, and left and gotten bad and and when I came back over and it looked like that, I was flabbergasted. And, it, and it's, they're playable now. I, I don't think either one of them have ever been played in my entire life. But Perry gave that gift to me. He gave gifts like that to you too. And to a lot of people that aren't here today. Perry was that kind of a person. And his love for violin, of course, goes back to that reading that we've heard before and he's done so many times and we're going to have that here again in a minute today. You know, Perry was not a fancy man in the sense of putting on airs, trying to impress anybody. Now he was a fancy man in the gentleman's sense, you know, when he came here on Sunday he was dressed nice, looked nice, that was important to him. He kept their house nice. He had proper and prim manners. But he was a very humble man. And he walked with the Lord in a very meaningful way that has touched a lot of our lives. You wouldn't be here today if that wasn't true. I think, indeed, that scripture today that we read earlier is significant. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We're going to have a prayer, and, and uh, then my son had recorded for me that we used in our Easter service the uh, reading about the old violin, and we're going to play that again today. He, I, I emailed him and told him we were doing that, and he sent a note back and said, well, send my condolences to the church. He's never met Perry, but uh, he had done this for me. So we're going to do that, and then we're also going to have some of the words of committal before we close things out. So let's bow together for just a moment of prayer. Lord, we've touched on just a few things out of 92 years of life. But God, maybe it sparked in, in some of us here a special memory of a man that we loved, a man who loved us well. Lord, when we leave this place, we'll move on into the next chapters of our lives, the next days ahead. May we walk the way Perry walked, with you close at our side, wanting to serve, wanting to give, wanting to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy the reading. "'Twas battered and scarred, 
and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people, he cried. Who starts the bidding for me? One dollar? One dollar. Do I hear two? Two dollars. Who makes it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no, from the room far back, a gray-bearded man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What now am I bid for this old violin? As he held it aloft with its bow, One thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who makes it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried, We just don't understand. What's changed its worth? Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once, he is going twice, he is going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Twas battered and scarred. Perry quoted that to me one time at his house. Most of you, I suppose, heard Perry's voice as that was read because you remember him doing that. The message was a true message. The master violin played well on this instrument. And may he play well through your life as well. Perry's body is going to be taken from here and head down to Tennessee where the burial will be. So we're going to have our own committal part of the service up here. And I always like to remind us that once again, death has invaded our midst, reared its ugly head, reminded us of our own mortality as well. And that it is our sad duty to commit to the ground Perry's body from which it came earth to earth and dust to dust and ashes to ashes. But it is also our privilege to commend his spirit to the eternal and merciful God for his better care than any that we could give. Where, God, where Perry has now entered to live with God forever. The scripture in 1 Thessalonians says this, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's the encouragement we have in our grief today. We, it's not that we don't grieve. It's that we don't grieve like people without hope. We have hope, and Perry lived that hope, and we know that hope, and the Scripture promises that hope, and Jesus demonstrated that hope in this season of the year at Easter time. There's a poem I'd like to share with you called No Tears Past the Gate. Someone now has entered our eternal home above. The heavenly gate has opened wide to welcome the one you love. We cannot help the tears that fall. Our hearts need time to grieve when earthly life has ended and a loved one has to leave. Yet even in the saddest time, we know our Savior lives and we can trust completely in the promise that he gives. Someday in a glad reunion with the Lord, our loved ones wait to welcome us with joy and no more tears beyond the gate. 
The psalm in your flyer says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, where Perry is dwelling now. The last little thing I want to close with is in those very early days when I first was at, met Perry at his home, on the wall he had a number of things that are still out at the uh, apartment now. One of the things he had on there was a little... Uh, I don't know if it's needlepoint or what, I don't remember, but it was in Hebrew. And he was talking about the time he got to go over to the Holy Land, and we talked about that. He says, I, he says, I, I, I don't remember what that says. And I said, oh, I said, yeah, no. I said, this word you know, Perry, that's shalom. And he said, oh, yeah, that's right, peace. But the second word he didn't know, and the little plaque said nothing more but Shalom Alechem, which means, and this is what I'd like to end with, peace upon you. Amen.